Uh, so hi, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Daniel, for introduction, and thanks a lot for uh, having me here. I'm really excited because it is actually the first uh, chance for me to talk about everything that I love, and it includes both the Bitcoin and cryptography and security and quantum physics. Uh, so I normally don't have a chance to mix this uh, all together. So uh, yeah, we will have some fun here. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, first about myself, uh, I am a quantum physicist by education, so it looks like many physicists are out there. Uh, and I used to work in quantum physics for more than 10 years, basically like my whole life, uh, starting at university, then uh, PhD, then one postdoc, another postdoc here at Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. And I was normally doing the research in the experimental uh, quantum simulators and quantum computers. Uh, and uh, I uh, can I got into Bitcoin in 2013, and it took me a few years before I understood that, okay, uh, I am I really want to drop my uh, quantum career, academic career, and actually switch to Bitcoin. And uh, I was very lucky to uh, find a few guys uh, that uh, we founded a company, and now we are doing this uh, secure Bitcoin hardware platform, such that developers would have a tool to build awesome stuff uh, on top of the hardware. Uh, so yeah, I have kind of expertise a little bit on both fields. Uh, and uh, the main thing uh, I want to talk about is first, uh, uh, what are the problems with our private keys? How uh, can we store them and what are the risks there? Uh, and the second one is, uh, are there any threats from quantum computers to the uh, Bitcoin as a whole? Uh, because uh, I think that the main value that Bitcoin brings to us uh, and the main problems that it solves is that uh, we now have a mathematically controlled emission of the money. So this means that if we want to keep our value uh, on, on the one run, we can't really rely on uh, central banks and on the fiat money because uh, they are constantly diluted by printing the new money. So the main issue here is that we have a enforced by the uh, consensus protocol uh, limit of the bitcoins. And so if we own 10 bitcoins now, then probably in 20 years it will be worth the same or hopefully more. Uh, so this is the uh, main thing. Unfortunately, as the whole ecosystem is uh, currently still uh, evolving and we don't have uh, uh, all the infrastructure around it, uh, we also have to deal with a few problems. So to keep our value, to keep our money, we, have basic, uh, we need to be sure of two things. First, that we really keep them, that we don't lose them. And this is about the security of our private keys and uh, what can go wrong there. And the second, that as Bitcoin as a whole is secure. And this is why people get a little bit paranoid about quantum computing and that they will break the classical cryptography and so on. Uh, so I will talk about both of these things. Uh, and the first one about the private keys. So you probably recognize this kind of thing. Uh, this is the uh, recovery phrase from normal Bitcoin wallets. Uh, and basically, it is just a, uh, it is everything that you need to control your Bitcoin. So if you lose this or if you share it with someone, then, well, basically, your Bitcoins can be stolen. And uh, these words are actually just a, a human readable representation of a number. So just a big number, well, not that big number, so like uh, 32 or 64 bytes, uh, is enough to control your Bitcoins. So we really, really, really need to keep this uh, number very safe and secure and not share it with anyone. And here we have a problem. And here I think that it is a great opportunity for the banks because, well, uh, people normally uh, used to have some guarantees either enforced by the laws or uh, by the institutions such, they, uh, such that even if we are completely hacked, we don't lose much. We can recover. Uh, and in case of Bitcoin, at the moment, we can't really recover. Uh, and uh, so what's, as soon as you start caring about your private key, you fall, fall into this uh, rabbit hole where you become more and more and more paranoid. And uh, I'm extremely paranoid and I want to share this paranoia with you. <laughs> uh, so first, uh, let's talk a bit. If we store our Bitcoins on our normal computer, like in the software wallet, what can go wrong? Uh, well, the problem here is that computers are made to be convenient, fast, and multitasking. So this means that together with our Bitcoin wallet that stores our secret, we have a bunch of other applications and other crap that is running all the time and that may be designed not with security in mind so it can have bugs. 
uh, and it also even applies to the uh, cryptographic uh, library. So we had the hard bleed, uh, an attack on OpenSSL. We had Meltdown and Spectrum that uh, kind of allows you to uh, exit the virtual machines and uh, monitor the other processor that you shouldn't uh, really uh, have access to. Uh, then after the release of this uh, NSA uh, tools, uh, hackers start building awesome new uh, research tools uh, to do penetration testing and other things like that. So, But uh, it becomes very cheap. It, it becomes very uh, easy to get into the normal computer. Uh, and so uh, as we want to protect our private keys, we need to invent something uh, to to do that. And then there are mm, uh, people started using uh, these paranoid setups where you use either a completely air get uh, single board computer that you never connect to the internet or security oriented uh, operation system where you have a trade off between the convenience and the security that tries to uh, kind of keep your applications isolated or safe or stateless, uh, so different approaches. Uh, then uh, we started caring about open source. Uh, so we definitely want to know what exactly we are running, what this um, uh, whole uh, software is doing. So we do need uh, to at least trust the community to verify the code if we can't read the code ourselves. Uh, then we want uh, open hardware that we know uh, on top of what hardware actually our software is running. Uh, and then uh, we started using the deterministic builds. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a nice picture for deterministic builds, so I used this one. So we need to uh, be sure that the binary that we download is the same, uh, is compiled from the same code that we audited. Uh, and uh, also we uh, started creating the hardware wallets uh, that are dedicated devices that don't uh, run random junk, but only uh, work as a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, and only uh, the only purpose of these devices is to keep our private keys safe. Uh, so these are pretty nice approaches that allow you to make the private key a little bit safer, but it's kind of not enough. Uh, and uh, as soon as the Bitcoin value rises and you have more and more funds into in, in your wallet, there is intensive for the attacker to go to grab your hardware and to put their dirty hands into the hardware. Uh, so, and uh, then we have a bunch of other nice and cheap sometimes tools uh, how to actually already hack the hardware. And the problem with the hardware is that if it is a normal one, then it is probably built on the on top of legacy architectures that we invented, like starting from 80s and earlier, uh, when we didn't really think about security and we had to maintain all this legacy between the generations of controllers, and we are racing into performance, not into the security. Uh, so the uh, hardware, in principle, is uh, unless the, it is a special specialized hardware, is pretty vulnerable. Uh, so there are different attacks on the hardware. For example, uh, uh, glitching where you, uh, even if you have a perfectly fine software that is uh, nicely designed and doesn't have any bugs, if you put the device that it is running in some unnormal conditions, for example, you um, drop the supply voltage for a short period, or you mess up with the clock, or you uh, do some electromagnetic wave in, uh, injection onto the chip, uh, then Cheap will misbehave, do some weird things, so you have some weird bugs, and then the attacker can exploit these weird bugs to extract your private keys. Uh, also, as we have these private keys, we need to store them, and they are just like uh, pretty small numbers. So, if we, we would be able to get to uh, the semiconductor level to read the transistors and to see where exactly the secret is stored, it is also a problem. And then another one is the side channels when we use, uh, well, it's physics underneath, right? So transistors are switching and uh, power is consumed, uh, there is a power consumption. So all this, uh, if you start to monitor everything around your chip, you will find uh, some way to uh, get some hints about the private keys. And uh, often it is enough to extract the full private key. So uh, here we can go one level deeper in our paranoia. Uh, and we can start using things like, for example, anti-temper meshes. Uh, unfortunately, these are 
normal for banks, but not normal for normal people. Uh, so, like, we have uh, all this hardware uh, in the industrial status, but it is not available for normal users. So, again, there is an opportunity. You have all this infrastructure. You are caring about your secrets uh, in your data centers and... Uh, uh, you can just provide this service to the Bitcoiners to uh, kind of securely store the private keys for them. Uh, maybe in some kind of un uh, not very trusted setup where you use a multi-signature, but uh, still there are ways. Uh, then uh, we started using multi-signature setups when we don't trust a single device. We start splitting the keys around multiple de uh, of them. And so the attack surface reduces because you need to hack many of them. And uh, it also helps. Uh, also, secure elements, unfortunately, none of them uh, support uh, Bitcoin curve out of the box, but there are ways. Uh, and finally, like vaults. So if you guys think that you are not dealing with Bitcoins at all, you're wrong. Because probably if you are providing the deposit box service, then in some of these deposit boxes, there are hardware wallets or maybe sheets of paper with these mnemonics uh, that are uh, used as a backup for the Bitcoin wallets of Bitcoiners. Um, okay, then there are other problems. If even if the uh, hardware is stable and secure, uh, there are different things like uh, backdoors or... Um, let's say instruction sets that are not very well documented, um, I mean, not documented at all, and documented only for trusted parties, uh, or there are hardware implants, so basically there are ways also to mess with the hardware. Uh, so here, uh, people started using like off-the-shelf uh, devices that are like more general purpose and convert them into the hardware wallets. Uh, they started using Faraday cages to make sure that no information is leaking from the device. Uh, and also uh, people started using like, like this transparent casing for the devices so that you can actually see that there, are, there is nothing else included. Uh, so this is how it would look like from the marketing perspective. This is how it looks like in reality. Uh, but uh, still, oh, yeah, it helps. Uh, so uh, basically, we have a bunch of problems, how to secure our private keys. Uh, and there is uh, a, well, not every not everyone wants to be their own bank. Not everyone wants to uh, put their uh, put a Faraday cage in the apartment or uh, I don't know build a vault uh, or do all this hardware stuff. So uh, yeah, there is an opportunity and th it is a real problem. So right now the main problem is when uh, private keys are lost or stolen or uh, leaked. Uh, so then let's say we kind of can secure our private keys, then the next problem is, are we sure that all this, our Bitcoins will be at the same value in the future? Maybe something will go wrong and the Bitcoin network as a whole will be broken. And one of the threats that people think uh, will damage the Bitcoin is uh, quantum attacks. In particular, because there are a few quantum algorithms that can break classical crypto cryptography that uh, Bitcoin is relying on. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, not really. So this is like uh, to one didn't read, and now it a little bit in more details. Uh, so uh, how quantum computers really work? Uh, we have normal bits in our uh, classical computers that can be either zero or one. And these qubits are more like bits on steroids. Uh, so they are like anything between zero and one on this 3D sphere. So basically they're somewhere there in an undetermined state. Uh, and we define the state only when we measure it. Uh, and then we can put them together and uh, entangle them together and do all the crazy stuff. Uh, and uh, in principle, if we think about how quantum computer operates, uh, I have this imaginary more. more well, uh, version. So imagine that we have a bunch of bars and we want to uh, find out which one is the highest one. So what classical computer does? It basically kind of measures every bar individually, then compares these numbers, uh, and then calculates which one is the highest one. So during this computation, it does a lot of unnecessary useless stuff. Uh, it calculates the height of every of, uh, of them. But what we really need, we just 
we don't need this information. We only need the one that is saying, okay, the third one is the highest one. So that is roughly what the quantum computer does. Uh, you can encode all this uh, problem into the qubits. Uh, then you can uh, apply a certain gates uh, in a certain way such that when you measure it, you have an answer that is three. And then you learn nothing else, literally. But it also saves uh, some uh, computational time. So basically, it is much more efficient in some cases. Um, basically, there are two uh, major algorithms that uh, are uh, mentioned when we talk about classical cryptography. Uh, the first one is the Grover's algorithm that uh, is, um, well, you don't need to watch it this at the right side. It's uh, just for illustrative pur purposes. Uh, so it, it allows you to uh, solve any problem uh, pretty efficiently. Uh, in particular, uh, it is uh, more for the hashing. Uh, so like when we are mining or when we are hashing and we get, uh, well, we, we need to recover from the hash to the original thing that we were hashing, uh, we basically need to brute force. In the classical computer, we need to try all possible options uh, to get the answer that hashes to the right value. Uh, so with the quantum algorithm, you can do it a little bit better. So you can put all possible options uh, Entangle them together, put them together, and then again do all these gates things uh, to get at the end uh, the result. The result that will be uh, an answer to your question. Uh, so uh, it is not, well, it is efficient, more efficient than the classical one, uh, but it is not super efficient. So uh, it's like not uh, going from uh, terra hashes per second to like in a few milliseconds I will get the answer. So it's more like uh, from terra hashes to giga hashes. So it, it helps, but it is like not a um, silver bullet. Uh, then there is a second one that is a Shor algorithm uh, that allows you to break the uh, RSA and as well as uh, discrete log and elliptic curves uh, problem. So basically, uh, it can help to factorize the uh, the product of two prime numbers pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, it will break the elliptic curve cryptography that we are using, uh, but we are working on the uh, quantum safe algorithms, even though they are very in the very, very beginning, so they don't work right now. Uh, and they can be broken by the classical computers at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so that's pretty weird. Uh, but uh, in principle, I would say that if we have enough time, then we can change our signature scheme to something new and nice and uh, proved, uh, well, provably secure uh, against the quantum computers. Uh, so, where it looks a little bit scary, like you can break elliptic curves, you can uh, kind of break the hashing. Uh, so, where are we now? Uh, the thing is that to do these algorithms, we need like of the order of uh, tens of thousands qubits and millions of gates. Uh, and at the moment, in the industry, we have like 100 qubits, like two orders of magnitude, 100 uh, times less, uh, and around 1,000 gates. And the problem is that all these qubits are super fragile. So all this entanglement, to make it work, uh, you need to really uh, nicely isolate the whole system from the environment. You need to build a complicated lab. Uh, and basically, there are breakthrough breakthroughs um, like that adds order of magnitude every, let's say, 10 years. Uh, so in the worst case scenario, we will get something reasonably uh, efficient maybe in 20, 30 years. But I would say more like about 40, 50. Uh, so we have some time, and come on, Bitcoin is just 10 years old. So imagine what will happen to Bitcoin in another 10 years. So the technological uh, development is really amazing. Uh, and a few pictures just to get you the understanding of how exactly the quantum computing lab looks like. This is one of the tables in our lab. Every optical element here is used. So this whole setup is used only to put the lasers into the right spots at right frequencies to stabilize them and things like that. So there are no qubits here. It's just optics, just a preparation for the main experiment. And there are like plenty of students running around and uh, tuning everything uh, every day to just keep it working somehow. So it is an extremely complicated system. Uh, and then you also need a pretty complicated either vacuum setup or in my field or uh, more like superconducting circuits and another ones. Uh, but the whole thing is extremely complicated. And uh, yeah, I. 
I built the web like that and it took like five years and uh, only after five years you start actually measuring something. So like basically if you have a nice idea from the uh, beginning to where you can actually measure something, like verify your idea, you need to take five years. So that is why we have these huge steps between the breakthroughs in quantum computing. Uh, and basically what I want to say, we do have some time before quantum computers will be able to compute something reasonable. Because right now, uh, saying about RSA, let's say, we have huge 2048 numbers, uh, that uh, bit numbers, and uh, we need to factorize them. What quantum computer can do right now, you can take the quantum computer, the number 15, and it will tell you that it is three times five. Uh, it will have certain problems as soon as you go even to something like 100 uh, one or something. Uh, so uh, we have time, but we need to be very, very careful because if you don't design cryptography nicely, then it can have bugs. And as I said, it can be broken by even classical computers. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, there were recently the... Um, uh, kind of uh, suggestion to propose uh, quantum safe algorithms uh, and like 99% of them were broken with classical computers and who knows what happens with the quantum computers. So uh, we really need to take our time and to design it well, but if we do that, then we are safe. Uh, so uh, I ran out of time, almost perfectly in time. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know, I, don't, ah, I think that there are no questions, so no questions. Yeah. <laughs>